Good evening and welcome to Prophetic News Tonight. We are showcasing prophetic words from Dutch Sheets, Mario Murillo, and Todd Coconato. Let's not waste any time and get right into it. When he says, take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, he says it's a weapon against the enemy. Jesus showed us when he was tempted what the best weapon was. Every time the devil tried to do something, he said, it is written. Must have been frustrating to the devil. He wants a conversation. Jesus just says, it's written. He tells him what the Bible says. When you release the word of the Lord, he has no defense. It becomes a sword. But when he says, take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, the word there is rhema. There's graphe, written words. These are not just, these are not even religious words. They just apply to religious things also. Graphe is written down words. Rhema is words coming out of your mouth, spoken words. Lagos is the message in the words. Three words for words in the New Testament. So you have the written word. Jesus said, it is written, graphe. He took the written down words and he said them, that's rhema. And the message in the words is logos. We get the word logic from logos. That's why Jesus is called the word. He's not called the rhema and he's not called the graphe. He's more than the written word and he's more than spoken words. He's the message in the words. But in Ephesians 6, he says, take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. He says, rhema. And do not make the mistake, you know, there's, there are teachings that rhema means revelation. That when God gives you a revelation, that's a rhema. God can give you revelation from graphe or rhema, but that's not what the words mean. The words mean, the word rhema simply means spoken words. <clears throat> so when you put that back into the verse, what it says is, take the spoken word, which is the sword of the spirit. It is not a sword against the enemy until you say it. Just because you think it, it's not doing anything to the devil. It's helping you, and you can meditate on it. But even meditation means to speak and mutter and, and, and not just think about it. But you can think about the word, and it can help you and encourage you. But it's not a sword against the devil until you say it. And when it comes out of your mouth, it does something in the atmosphere. You start decreeing what God says out loud, your atmosphere in your house will change. You start decreeing what God says about you, your mind will change. You start decreeing what he says about California, California will change. <clears throat> it won't happen just because we came here. And it won't happen just because we leave here encouraged. It won't happen just because we have faith. It will happen when that faith causes us to release something this is the outlet of your spirit. Jesus didn't just think, peace be still to the storm. He said it, and he didn't say it because storms can hear. He said it because spoken words have power. And then when they come from God. He didn't say to the fig tree, or he didn't think to the fig tree, nobody's going to eat from you again. He said it, and he didn't say it because fig trees can hear. He said it because the power in him needed to get out of his mouth. So what, what I want to do is this. I want to begin with the impossible part. The cities are being destroyed. My hometown is a human tragedy. It is a wreckage. There's no doubt about it. Their policies have done it, and there's no excuse for it. Now, you're seeing the same thing in Los Angeles, which is your hometown. Yeah. And yeah. What, what are you sensing as the present? We're not going to talk about the future. We're talking right now. What is the condition of Los Angeles, California, in your mind? It's Unbelievable. So where we used to have the church, uh, we saw the homeless encampments literally coming uh, farther and farther out. We were in the suburbs, you know, not too far out of Los Angeles, about 30, 30 minutes outside. But those encampments have now come to the area where I grew up, 
where I went to high school, where we planted the church in California. And uh, it was it was crazy, Mario. I mean, these are neighborhoods that were at one point, you know, uh, middle to upper class neighborhoods that are now uh, high crime riddled. Uh, the school systems have gone down in those areas as a result of just all the different things that are happening in the community. But here's here's something that most people don't know. In Beverly Hills, Beverly Hills, California, this is probably one of the most expensive areas in the country. OK, other than some areas in San Francisco and some places out in New York, but one of the most highest value real estate areas in the country and people are telling me people that we know that live in the area that they're they go out in their backyard and there's somebody in their backyard there's people that are trying to live in their backyard there's there's people that are breaking into their yeah. homes and so many of these residents are now fleeing the state because they say i don't even feel safe at home in beverly hills now mario that is a big deal if you know the demographics of los angeles and you know it used to be where it's yes impossible. there was there was south central there were certain areas where you know people say yes there's gangs and all that but in beverly hills that was unheard of that's where it's now at and that's why so many people have fled the state of california and one of the things that i think is important to mention is there's a difference between a crime rate a crime wave and what's happening in these cities what's happening in san francisco what's happening in los angeles is not a crime rate or a crime wave it is a complete takeover yeah. So that literally you cannot count on law enforcement to keep you safe in any area of Southern California or in San Francisco. It is it has been dismantled. Now, in a moment, we're going to we're going to run a video of something going on in San Francisco right now. But what I want to do is set it up and uh, make another comment. And then I want to ask you to chime in on this this point that I'm making. These cities are beyond repair and the 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 tone of the city fathers and the people not talking about the politicians right now i'm not talking about the political power structure of new york san francisco or chicago i'm talking about the people the people that have lived there all their lives whose families have caused much of the wealth that those cities have known this the wealth the culture the education these are the par the par parents of the city, and they all are saying the same thing, Todd. What's going to happen to us? What's going to happen to us? You know, later on, I'm going to show you a, a condition in the city of New York that literally, if it continues, there will be 8 million people who won't know what to do with their future at all if it continues the way it's going in New York. But no city has lost its infrastructure like San Francisco has, lost control of what's going on in the streets. And, and you and I both know because we love California, right? I we have California. a personal investment. I mean, yeah. how has your heart been affected by what's going on in Los Angeles right now? Because you knew it before and after. And, uh, and what does it do to you, God? Deeply grieves my heart. We we moved there, you know, from Cincinnati, Ohio, when I was very young. And when I moved out there, Ronald Reagan was the governor of California. And during that time, the state of California was one of the best places to live. Uh, you know, it was a red state, believe it or not. And uh, you yeah. know, education was was decent. It wasn't the best, but it was decent. You, it was safe for the most part. I mean, it had its issues just like every big city, but for the most part, Mario, you felt safe walking around the city. You know, you didn't see what you're seeing there now. It absolutely breaks my heart. You know, a lot of this has to do with uh, some of this defund the police movement and some of these policies that have been initiated where they have put handcuffs for, for lack of a better term on the police that they can't really do their job. Uh, some of the people like some of these Soros backed DAs and other uh, officials that have been planted into these government offices in these cities are, are letting criminals go, um, you know, very short sentences, uh, catch and release type thing where they just let these people go. Uh, and, and so they, they, they do quite, you know, for instance, let me give an example. My wife worked in retail and she worked in the Sherman Oaks Galleria. And, uh, you know, when I started in the retail, you know, I've also worked in retail. They used to capture these guys and, and bring them in and get them arrested and the, the stores would prosecute. The laws right now 
up into a certain amount, they don't even prosecute. So what people do is they do these mm. grab and runs. They come in with these big mobs and they take all the purses and all the high high value retail. Thing. I mean, so this is happening to the point where uh, Harold Square was it Harold Square? Uh, no, no, the other one, Union Square, Union Square in in San Francisco, San literally Francisco. closed down, closed down their flagship stores of Bloomingdale's and Macy's and in, in one the second biggest mall in the country from a volume standpoint. So this is happening all over the state, but it's happening in Los Angeles and it is absolutely just destroyed the infrastructure of the city. And so many people, Mario, that I know uh, have left because of this, but those that are still there are, are so grieved and just can't believe what's happening to their state. And that's, that's how we felt about it as well. Well, in order to build on the miracle that we're going to predict that I'm going to predict, I'm going to leave you off the hook on this one, Todd. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, I'm going to show you a video of San Francisco and afterwards we need to talk about it. But I want you to listen carefully while you're watching this video. Please listen carefully to what is being said about what's going on in that city right now. It's very important that you pay. Give it your undivided attention. Let's roll it right now. This is San Francisco, the city that pays drug addicts to use drugs? I mean, if we're going to be realistic, they pay you to be homeless here. I get 620 bucks a month. Dude. This right now is, is literally by choice. How many times have you died? About 40 times the last year. Almost a handful of times. I've died on my feet, standing in one spot. I met this chick right out here. She's pretty cute, yeah. That's the night that she, she shot me with fentanyl. I don't do fentanyl at she, all. She forcibly injected fentanyl. In. With record high overdose deaths in 2023, rampant homelessness, deadly drug addiction, and unpunished shoplifting and car break-ins, businesses are fleeing and the city is dying. But how did it get to this point and can it be fixed? So I met up with JJ Smith, a citizen journalist who's lived in the Tenderloin, the heart of San Francisco's drug crisis his entire life. I started to see too many of my family, too many of my friends, a lot of my friends dying off of fentanyl. But what it is, is a lot of people trying to normalize it. Majority of everybody out here that you think is homeless, a lot of them ain't homeless. They got homes to go to, they got family houses, they got friend houses. Some of them even got husbands or wives houses. They just can't do their drugs there, so they decided to come live on the streets and do it. But what drugs were people using out here? What type of drugs you use? I use fentanyl and crystal meth. I started very young with uh, busting drugs at, at my mom doing heroin. Can you tell me what you're up to right now? Um, getting well. Getting well? Yeah, I'll all right. all. Smoke it on some foil. All right there. Yep, ISO and then clean ISO. So those are like, you know. How many times have you died? Me? Uh, but I have almost a handful of times, I think. A handful of times? Yeah. I died on my feet, standing in one spot, and my, my wife right here screaming my name, shaking me. Question for you, man. What are you using in the pipe? Is it meth? Yeah. If I was able to offer you some treatment to get into a rehab, would you accept it? At the moment, no. Why not? Uh, it's not ready. Let's start with the most important aspect of the video you just saw. A lot of those people that are homeless have homes, but they're on the streets because the city they're in, in the name of getting them them off of drugs created a system that allows them to openly use drugs and then empowered the criminal gangs to start an industry to provide cut rate fentanyl one of some of the largest amounts anywhere in the united states that are flooding the city of san francisco right now and killing people you know uh, we're talking about 752 deaths on in that area that one area 752 deaths from overdoses of one drug, fentanyl, not taking into the account the others, not taking into the account the shootings, the murders associated with the drug trade. That city is dying right before our eyes. And you mentioned Union Square. 80 years ago, Macy's came to Union Square. It was there for 80 years. It survived wars. It survived the Great Depression but it didn't survive the fentanyl invasion created by the legislation and the wokeness of a city. And it's an impossible situation right now. And did you see, Todd, that they were literally talking about how many times they had died? Did you see yes, that part? I did. I did. And you know what I was thinking when that 
came on is how many ministries are even touching on fentanyl addiction? How very few. I mean, I think a teen challenge and some of the, the organizations that are doing a great job in this area, but not a lot. Most ministries, Mario, stay within the four walls. They're not even getting out to these folks. And how many families that are watching, you know, I asked this on a broadcast recently and I was shocked, Mario, how many people reached out to me and said, yes, my family has been touched by fentanyl. My family has been touched by methamphetamine. We don't talk about it in the church and it's very rarely discussed from the pulpit and we don't really have many ways to really address this epidemic it's a demonic epidemic that is being led by to your point the incentivization of this uh especially in these blue cities a lot of these are these sanctuary cities where they're telling people come here and then they're incentivizing them to your point to do drugs to be homeless it's 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 just an outward uh, expression of the inward spiritual dilemma that we're having in our nation the heart issue that we're having here in america right now there is no solution in the natural, Todd. There's none. Do you see any, you know, if Trump wins, even if Trump wins, it's impossible to imagine that there is on the horizon anything that could fix this because it's so far gone. And even with the best amount of money, the most amount of workers, everything that we can imagine that's a human remedy for this with the highest aspirations, it's an impossibility. Don't you feel that way right now? I'm talking about in the natural. Yeah, from a government standpoint, I 100% agree. You know, if you think about the way this country was put together, and of course, they always throw around the term separation of church and state, but that was a letter of the Danbury Baptist saying the government was going to stay out of the church's business. And the deal about this is, if you think about it, is the church was what kept this country moral, morally sound and grounded. And the church was was affecting all these different areas. Since we've now looked to government to be the solution, this is a disaster, an absolute disaster. So to your point, Mario, in the natural, there is no solution. I think about all my friends, you know, I came out of Hollywood and, you know, I saw many friends that were addicted on different drugs and, and, and there was like a 2% recovery rate. And they would go to these very expensive rehab facilities. And I know many of you have witnessed this as you watched in pop culture, as some of your favorite, favorite stars and celebrities over the years have gone to these things. It's very rare that they actually get out of it unless they find God. That's the only way. It's a 2% recovery rate. But with Jesus, it's a 100% recovery rate. And notice this, that the left hates the police and hates the church. And if you ask the people on the streets what they wish they had most was police enforcing the law and faith. They wish they had those things. They treat pastors like criminals in San Francisco and in New York. They Here they're watching, and this is how I know it's demonic, Todd, and I want you to again chime in on this, because I believe you know that, that demon activity is real. There is a demonic mindset in these leftist cities that makes them double down on the policies that are not working. Instead of reevaluating them and saying, we made a mistake, loss of civility and, and safety and crime are still passing bills to decriminalize and to encourage the people that are victim. And now they want to, for example, give reparations for the, all the families that were, uh, had to be moved in eminent domain in order to build Dodger Stadium. LA, this is what they're fixated on, Todd. They're going to go back, find the families that were displaced by building Chavez Ravine, which is Dodger Stadium, and pay them in, in reparations for what they went through. Meanwhile, thousands are dying on the streets. Thousands are being victimized by crime, but this is our fixation. We're going back in history. Yep. We're, we're, in fact, you talk about the ultimate hypocrisy. You're doing evil. Meanwhile, you're virtually signaling about the evil that was done generations ago. That's Why right. don't you work on what's going on right now? Why don't you comment on that, my friend? Well, there's so much to comment about. I mean, I think about that guy from, I think it was the Kansas City Chiefs that just came out and gave that speech. He was talking about families and family values, and he got ridiculed and threatened and ostracized online to the point where they were even looking to see if they could possibly, you know, get him out of the team. I mean, so much stuff happened from that, and that went quite viral. 
But, you know, it really shows where we're at as a society where you can't even come out and talk about family values anymore. And to your point, we've been so indoctrinated and inundated. And, and you know, we're coming up on June. I know you're going to make a big announcement to counter this whole yep. thing. But, but the deal is, if you think about this, this everybody has to understand we're seeing history repeat itself. The Bible says there's nothing new under the sun. And what we're seeing right now is almost verbatim. There's some differences, but in many ways, Mario, the, the Firepower Army, our viewers, no matter where I go, they say thank you for speaking about these things. And this is the next thing they say, and it really grieves my heart. They say, I don't understand why other people aren't having these conversations. It's so clear to them, just as it's so clear to us, the only way that we could possibly justify what's going on with these laws and these things, that these policies, is that their minds are reprobate. And we know it's a spiritual battle of light versus darkness, but what we understand and what this, this broadcast and those that watch understand is they're coming for the church. They're coming for the word of God. They're coming for biblical Christianity. That's what's the core of this. And, and so they're, they're willing to get rid of all law and order, which why Trump was such a big, you know, many of us appreciated his policies. He was a president of law and order. Well, right. who is the lawless one in the Bible? It's the devil. The devil's the lawless one. So these are demonic things that are happening in our cities on our watch. And for the most part, we're not doing much about it, are we, Mario? And that's that's where we're nope. going to get into the firepower perspective in a little bit. But it's very important to yep. lay out this case. Yeah. So in the Bible, I want to read Luke 9, verse starting in verse 54, where it says, And when his disciples James and John saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them just as Elijah did? But he turned and rebuked them and said, you do not know what manner of spirit you are of. That's going to become very important on this show, folks. Hold steady. Verse 56, for the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. The occasion, the backstory is, is that going through Samaria was a shortcut to get to Jerusalem. Instead of going around it, Christ decided to go through it. Since they did not feel Jesus was there to minister to them, but only in transition to Jerusalem, the city got offended and Peter got mad. And you know what? Uh, it turned out that uh, it may have looked like Peter was right because that city went wholesale into immoral witchcraft. And, and, and Peter wanted to destroy it. Now, I was praying about this, Todd, and then the Lord said, I'm telling you what's going to happen in America. I said, mm -hmm. Lord, you really want to put me into the same circus where all these guys are saying this is going to happen, The what I call the God's about to movement. I don't really want to get in that. But then I remembered my mentor, David Wilkerson, when God dealt with him and said, I'm going to do something. And if I tell you, and the Bible says the secret of the Lord is with them that fear him. So I was going to make a prediction and I waited and we're actually going to see a video from Michigan right now where I finally went public with the prediction that I'm going to tell you and we're going to, we're going to dive into it. But let's watch that moment when I made the, uh, public statement. Here it is. This city that should have been destroyed still exists. Now Stephen is killed in Jerusalem and martyred. And the church, it says great persecution broke out and the church was scattered. And then it said Philip went down to the city that was supposed to be burned alive. He went down to the city that was supposed to not be there anymore. And I'm looking at you and you're telling me New York City is beyond God. Detroit is beyond God. St. Louis is beyond God. San Francisco and LA, no, God can't do it. But I'm telling you, not only can he, he is going to do it. I need you to shout right now. I need you to shout right now.
Look on the screen, you'll see Acts chapter 8 beginning at verse 5. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. Didn't he get the memo? Didn't Philip understand how harebrained and impossible? Not a, he's thinking to himself, Samaria is a witchcraft city and we're being killed in what's supposed to be a holy city. And if God isn't even moving in Jerusalem, how is he going to move in Samaria? And we're doing the same thing. We're waiting for revival in Tulsa, in Orlando, and in the Bible Belt. And it's not happening because our God is greater than regional religious spirit. I'm not getting enough out of you. I'm not getting enough. Matter of fact, the Bible Belt better understand you may get bypassed because you've got, you may not have fentanyl, but you have hypocrisy. And God is not a respecter of person. <laughs> Did I actually do that? I mean, I actually went there and I'm going to tell you, it's the blue state deep blue cities that are in the crosshairs of revival. Mm. And I want to, I want to tell you this, there was no intercessors in Samaria. There was no ground game in Samaria. There was no pastors league that phoned the evangelist in Jerusalem and asked him to come down and do a crusade. It was a sovereign supernatural intervention of God that turned a citadel ground zero of witchcraft and darkness into revival to where the whole city turned. And I'm going to say it again. The Bible Belt better be careful. The red states better be careful because you've got Christian concerts. You've got Christian this, Christian that. You've got every form of Christian culture there is. And you want revival and you believe in the Bible and you believe in all your heart. If God were to revive America, surely it would come in Dallas. Surely it would be in a hyper-Christian setting, but you could be dead wrong. I believe the Spirit of God is going to fall on San Francisco, Detroit, New York City, St. Louis, Miami, Seattle, Portland, Oregon. New York will be visited by God. Come on. It will be visited by a merciful God because there's something going on that we haven't factored in, Todd. There are yes. millions of innocent people. They can't afford to put their child in public school and a private school. They can't right. afford to get out of town. They're stuck and they're grieving and they reflect what God said about Nineveh. When Jonah, yeah. Jonah didn't even want to go there. He said, this is a horrible place. He didn't even want to go. And God gave him this incredible insight. He said, there are people that are crying out to me. And God mm. is hearing their cry. So yes. Mario Murillo Ministries, we're believing God now for a tent that will seat 7,000 people. You Come ready on. for that, Todd? That's um, our next yeah, move. Let's do it. We're going to expand to where we could seat 7,000 people. And God said, he rebuked me. He said, don't you dare tell me that a city is impossible to reach or that a Come door on. is closed. And you know what's going on in the body of Christ? They want these cities destroyed. Think mm. about that. Mm. The, the, they're not even thinking about reaching San Francisco or New York City. They're thinking it needs to die. These people are beyond hope. You have no idea that the religiosity of some of these hyper- uh, what people refer to as conservative areas where churches are, some of them grieve the heart of God every bit as much, if not more, than San Francisco or New York. Because yes. they're, they have the truth and they're not giving it. They've got millions of dollars and they're not sharing it. They have the power to make a difference in the places that matter. And I'm not going to disobey God. We are going mm. into the deep blue cities, Todd, and we're going to see miracles in Jesus' name. In now, Jesus' name. Now you're, <laughs> now you're hooked up with me on this. I'm sorry about that. So tell the people Let's what do you this. think. Well, you're <laughs> spot on. It, it bears witness in my spirit. You know, it, it's interesting because you and I have both seen California and then we've seen Nashville. And by the way, there's some amazing 
awesome remnant people here in Nashville. So we're not yes. bashing either yes. place. No. Okay. Absolutely. So, but you, not. here's the deal, though. Here's the deal. When you were in Cal, when I was in California, you knew Mario if somebody's a Christian. I'm going to tell you why because they wouldn't say they were Christian if they weren't. No, a Christian. they wouldn't. Now there, there's there's places and and you guys know what I'm talking about. Texas and you know the Bible Belt. To, to you know to your point, Mario is is there, a lot of people say they're Christian, but are they living the Christian life? Are they followers of Christ? Are they living out the Word? When you said what you said, I'm going to tell you this preacher here. My spirit took a leap. Okay, something happened in my spirit. I could sense it. And you know what else? I saw that crowd and there's youth in that crowd. There's amazing all, all different ages. But God said something to me. There's going to be another boom in the boomers. The boomers are not done. They're, they're going to nope. go out with a boom. And, and that's part of this end time harvest that we're about to see. It's already started. But in these blue cities, they're not done. You know, I wrote something in my notes because I knew you were to talk a little bit about Philip. But Philip's ministry in Samaria was marked by what? Powerful, miraculous signs. Hallelujah. Miraculous signs. He proclaimed the good news of the kingdom and in the name of Jesus Christ. And guess what? People listened to him and they saw miracles performed. And what happened? Unclean spirits were cast out and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. Mario, this is what's going to happen. This is this is what the Lord's been speaking our heart. It's already been happening. You're in the process of putting out a docufilm that's going to document how this has already happened. But I've noticed personally yeah. in the meetings, whether it's your meetings or the ones that we have, uh, all of the healing meetings, that I'm seeing more healings take place more regularly. And it is a sign and a wonder. And I know you've discussed this in length. And there's probably no one in this country that could speak to this more than you. But have you seen this? Because I believe this is what's happening. And we're going to see this as a sign and a wonder as we go in faith like Philip did into these cities. You know how uh, immediate our our ministry turned around? Our next two outreaches, our next three outreaches, let's talk about where they are. Yeah. The capital city of California on June the 2nd at Destiny Sacramento, a 3,000 seat building wow. under the shadow of the capital of California. Sunday night, June the 2nd, I'm going to be there in a miracle service. Mm, mm. God said Sacramento is going to get hit June the 2nd. The next day, June the 3rd, I'm going to be in a tabernacle that is in Oregon. Wow. And it's the Turner, it's in Turner, uh, Oregon, right near Salem, right Come outside on. of another capital. We're going to be in the tabernacle that was built over a hundred and how many years ago in the 1850s, excuse me, a revival broke out in Kentucky. One of the remnants that came out of that revival made it all the way to Oregon and built this 2000 seat tabernacle. And a year, 25 years ago, I walked into that building and I, I was visiting that part of Oregon and I walked in and I could hear the sound of saints praying. And I had no idea that 25 years later, I would be back in Oregon, a blue state, a deep blue state that is going to be rocked in the name of Jesus. And we're going to be in the tabernacle in Turner on June the 3rd, seven o'clock at night. And it's on a Monday night that we're going to do that. Then we're opening our crusade in New York. <laughs> so Come on. Blue State, California, Blue State, Oregon, Blue State, New York, Batavia, New York, between Buffalo and Rochester at Cornerstone Church Campus. Our tent is going up. We've already got hundreds of volunteers. We need more. That'll yes. begin on Sunday, June the 23rd through Wednesday the 26th. It's going to be amazing. So wow. you know what? It's like Paul said, Todd. I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. And right. we're negotiating right now for a 16,000 seat arena in San Francisco. That's My what goodness. we're negotiating for. Now, we're going to we're going to announce uh, an outreach that's going to happen right outside of Fresno in October. That's coming too. But God told me, he said, I'm going to pour out my spirit on the cities that everyone says is impossible. And I'm going to do the impossible in those cities. 
And I'm yes. I'm making a prediction. I'm going on record, and there I am. And Come I want to ask you now, you know what I want you to do, brother? I want you to preach right now because yes, there's sir. something in your spirit about this hour that we're living in. Todd, there's yes. something in you about this hour. Tell the yes. people right now. Don't hold back. Look, Listen, what, what it is, what's happening with our viewers right now, there's a lot of people that have just been instilled with hope because all they've heard is bashing from the Christian community about these cities that God can't. Listen, there's two words that, that are not in the scripture and they never will be. God can't. The fact is God can. He says to occupy until he comes. He says he's with us until the end of the age. He'll never leave us. He'll never forsake us. He goes before us. And so this is that time in America where the church, the remnant is rising up. And listen, I know what they're saying on the news. I know what they're saying in all the tabloids and all the different reporting. I even see it on our side, Mario. There's people that are just doom and gloom, doom and gloom. But we are seeing, listen, the Bible says in the last days, I'm going to pour out my spirit upon all flesh and listen we're in the last days we're seeing the spirit of god being poured out right now there's an anointing right now that's available if you want to walk and step into the river of living water it says out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water that's what the, the the fentanyl users need to hear that's what the addicted folks need to hear that there's hope that's found in jesus christ that's available today in 2024 but what it's going to take is us not to look at the ice on the land and say they're too big we're but grasshoppers to these you know people these demonic people that are making these laws and all this we're just you know we're grasshoppers no you're not you are on the winning team you're empowered by the spirit of god and so we're going to be a Joshua generation that are going to go into this promised land and take back the territory. And I believe the Lord is going to pour out in a very powerful and very fresh way. And Mario, when you said what you did, I'm telling you, it bore witness in my spirit. In fact, we're going Praise to be going God. June 6th, June 6th to Minneapolis. I'm going to be going to my yep. friend Charles, uh, Charles Karuku's uh, ministry up there called The Hub. And we're going to have a meeting on June 6th. Uh, in, in Minneapolis. That's another one of these blue cities. In fact, that's where a lot of the BLM protests were happening. So, you know, we got to go out. That's what's going to happen these next few months. It's going to intensify, but the Lord is going to move in a more intense way. Miracles, signs, and wonders. And Mario, I'm so thankful that you've made this prediction because I just know so many people are, are bearing witness right now in their spirit. I feel the anointing of the uh, Holy Spirit on this happen. broadcast. Yes. You know, I'm, I'm going to tell you, I'm not doubting that God can move. We still, we love these cities that I mentioned that are in the Bible Belt. God can move and will move, and I'm not going to deny it. And I'm, I'm going to preach in those places. But I'm telling you, the vanguard for America's transformation is going to come from the cities that we have written off. And we've written them off. And I got to tell you how thrilled I am, Todd. You know, I studied uh, about Sam Walton, who founded yeah. Walmart. And when he was in college learning about business, they said one of the truths, the axioms of business, is that no superstore can survive in a city of less than 50,000 population. He had an immediate moment of revelation. I'm going to put my stores in all the cities that are 50, less than 50,000 people. Because wow. he said immediately, I'm not going to have competition. And let me tell you about me. When I go to the cities and I'm going to, I'm going to get a name for our volunteer army and they're coming to our tent crusades in these cities that I've described, I'm going to call them unholy land tours. <laughs> unholy land tours is what they are. And we're going to get the elite, the brave, the trained, the, those who are strong in faith. And you're going to lay hands on children on the streets and they're going to get healed. You're going to watch gangbangers that are the, the most hardened criminals saved and miracles happen. I, I'm just getting geared up for it because it's going to happen. And I'm yes. going to tell you, we were just outside of Detroit. The picture you see behind me was just outside of Detroit. And I was thrilled when these young men tatted up from head to toe, started coming forward to get saved in, in, in uh, the, where we were in Howell, Michigan, with Pastor Bill used his campus, put up our tent on his campus. Lance did his courage tour during the day. We did miracle services and outreach at night. 
Let me tell you something. It's going to bust open. It's going to break open. And I'm not going to have any competition because we are so busy preaching in the same cities over and over and over again. All the Christian events are in this uh, conservative ghetto. And we're, we're totally not reaching these outside areas. We're going to go there. And God's going to give us a remnant that is going to shock the nation and I believe the world. And uh, you're coming with me, brother. I'm going to throw you into the, the, the white water, the deep end, because <laughs> you've got to preach on you. And you can't, you, you know, you and I, we, we are not here to comfort the people that want to stay in their bomb shelters. We're here to take a nation back for God. Amen. Yes. Now, while we're dealing with the impossible, you need to see this video about New York City. And this, again, is in the natural and this is where New York is at right now. And you need to see this and we're gonna comment on it right afterwards. You know something, New York City is really falling apart and between the asylum crisis and the crime crisis and the housing crisis, some people say the city is finished, but what nobody's talking about is what happens after that. So I will. Come on, man. If you take public transit, there's a decent chance you've already noticed them on your morning commute. National Guard members doing random bag checks in the subway system. Crime has been at the forefront of many people's minds after several MTA workers were recently attacked. This comes after 14 buses arrived from Texas in just one night last week, the highest number recorded by the arrival center. I spend more than half of my income on my rent. Overpriced. It's high. A new report from Street Easy says the average New York City rent must earn about $134,000 a year. Paramedics and police officers tried to pull the woman from under the train. Where is all these uh, National Guard that they, they said that they were going to come? Where is the safety? Where is the protection? So nobody wants to see a headline like this and have it be about their city. But the reality is you can find stuff like this about New York every week. Now look, I've been covering the major crises going on in New York for a long time now, and they've all got one thing in common which nobody's talking about. But to understand what that is, we've gotta look at the real reasons why all of these things are taking place, because once you know what those are, the commonality between all of them will make sense. And the other alarming thing I've realized is that New York City is home to over 8 million people. And if the city's in trouble, so are they. And what happens after that failure could change people's lives forever. Okay, what he's, we didn't get a chance to see in that video is the rule that is in New York that's on the books is no one should be kept on the streets. Anyone who asks for shelter must be given shelter as soon as they ask for it. So there were hotels that were going bankrupt and suddenly they filled them with all the right. illegals that are coming into the city and the hotel members are rich. 80% of the city wants that law to stay in place where no one is on the streets because they don't want the streets to be flooded with homeless people. But what they don't understand is that it is completely bankrupting New York City and there's no daylight in their immediate future that this is going to change. So like San Francisco, there's a day of reckoning for New York City and it's an impossibility. We got to remember that. But again, the Holy Spirit told me his spirit is going to fall on the inner cities of America and the people who are writhing in agony are going to see the fire of God. People that you and I have never heard of, names we've never heard before, are gonna rise up, begin preaching, some on street corners, some in clubs, some in rented facilities, some will take over abandoned churches. You'll see them in burned out buildings in Detroit, but voices are going to come up and suddenly they're gonna preach a gospel. Now let me say this about Philip while I got time. Imagine a modern preacher after Stephen died and Paul, who is currently at that moment Saul of Tarsus, the Bible says he was wreaking havoc on the church, putting people in prison. And then Philip goes down and preaches to them. All right, the modern preacher today would study witchcraft to understand their language and their mindset. 
Philip didn't do that. The modern preacher would be careful to come up with terminology that wouldn't offend an occultist who might be listening to him when he went there. And the modern preacher would certainly not rely on miracles as the vanguard expression to vindicate his sermon. He would want rhetoric. He want anecdotes. He want a music and a worship team and something that will soften the ground. Philip had none of that. And that's exactly what I'm telling you. The approach we need now is a raw, unfiltered gospel preached in the most dangerous parts of the nation because God's power is going to meet you there and it's going to release unlimited resources and power for it to happen. It's going to come. But now with the minutes, uh, we have time left. I don't want to say we don't. we got at least uh, 16 more minutes to go. And, and if we go over, so what? That's what I love about firepower. We're not locked into the clock here. All right, right, but I want to I want to begin. Tell the people, Todd, what you believe God can do for them if they take what we're saying tonight. Tell them right now that they can be used of God, that God can transform their weaknesses and make them strong and give them wisdom in this hour. Go ahead. That's right. It, it, you know, I take it back to what God's done in my life. I, I never aspired to be a preacher, an evangelist, Mario. That was the last thing that I would ever, you know, people that knew me back in the day, that's the last thing they would have said Todd Gogan I was going to be. I, I got a touch from the Holy Spirit and, and, you know, I got stabbed nine times, one in the heart. That was a big Damascus Road encounter for me. And if you want to see my testimony, you go to my website, pastortodd.org. But here's the deal. I had an encounter with God. And when you have an encounter with God, you can't go back. You can't be the same. It's no longer I that lives, but Christ that lives in me. My, my mind is transformed. I know you know what I'm talking about. And so we've got to get back to the basics. We've got to get back to our first love. We've got to have altar calls. We've got to, we've got to lay hands on the sick. We've got to do what the Bible says to do, to get back to the main thing, as Mario and I have talked about so often. But this is, this is it. I mean, if we have faith and we know that, look, this is bigger than us. It's bigger than a president. Okay, I know a lot of people are waiting for the election. And listen, we're going to vote. We're going to get involved. We're praying for it. We're more involved than right. most people. But ultimately, it's not going to be a president that's going to save America. It's got to be. And that's why both you and I, Mario, have gotten to the place where we're at right now, where we just look, we, it's got to, we're going full, full, you know, full steam ahead, pedal to the metal, because we know it's the only way that this country is going to be saved. And, and when you speak, and that's what Philip did, this, this story that you talk about today, there was joy in the land. There was, there was a, a tangible presence of God. There was revival, which is new life. And I believe this is what America needs. We are so desperate. We need new life. We need not a gimmick. We don't need some new celebrity preacher to get up and, and have some great show. We don't need smoke. We don't need mirrors, all that stuff, whatever. The, what we need is a move of God. And the only way that's going to happen is empowered preachers that are preaching with fire, that are preaching under the anointing yes. of God. And, and that's what's going to change. We've got to be into the anointing. And how do you get into the anointing? you got to have an authentic relationship with the Lord. you got to be in his word. you got to have an active prayer life. you got to be real because there's no faking it. There's no faking the anointing. And so I believe, Mario, we've got to a place of desperation. You know why this is more likely to break out in some of these cities? Because they're desperate. There's, they're, they're desperate. They, they've already looked to the elections. They've already looked to the law enforcement. They've already looked to every other person that they thought maybe could save them. At this point, it's, it's, it's a bottom line of help. That's all they can do. Just cry out to God, help. And that is oftentimes what God waits for. He waits for us to say, hey, we need you, God. We need you to move. And we start opening up our churches and getting on our face and saying, Lord, I don't know what else to do. We need you. We need, a, we need a plan. We need a strategy. We need your anointing. We need your move. We need your touch. And so I don't know who I'm talking to right now, but I think that you are being empowered, whether it's from you know going to one of these Mario Murillo crusades and catching the fire there, whether it's watching firepower, whether it's in your prayer closet, whether it's in your, your time in the word of God, you've got to get on fire and catch the fire and be a fire starter. We all do in our community, in our city. It, this is authenticity. It's, it's real. That's the only thing that's going to help, Mario. That's the, but the thing is, it is going to. That's the deal, is that the hope is absolutely real. It's absolutely possible. And I believe it's going to happen. But it's going to take these Esters 
and these Davids in this hour that are rising up right now, that God is raising up a standard and he's put a vision on your heart. He's put something, he's put a message in your heart. I believe ex-fentanyl users that are watching this broadcast right now, you've got the fire. Ex-prostitutes that are watching this broadcast, you got the fire. You may have had three or four abortions in your life and the enemies try to tell you to be ashamed, but that's under the blood. You've repented. You've got the fire. Go out there and teach the good news of Jesus Christ like Philip and watch what happens in your city. Watch what happens at that school board. Watch what happens in that Bible study. I'm telling you, I was talking to somebody today, Mario, she's on fire. She caught the fire and she's a hairstylist. And you know what? She's got a captive audience every time somebody sits in her chair. She's got the fire. And you know what? People are getting saved. Yes. Their lives are being changed. This is what it's about. People are anointing folks in the marketplace right now. Their businesses. We've got to catch the fire of God. And that fire will teach us three things that we've got to do in the firepower perspective. And let's start with number one. I want to read a verse. Uh, two verses. Acts chapter 8, verse 3 and 4. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. Watch the word, the first word in verse 4. Therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. Notice the defiance. They were being imprisoned for preaching the word, and their reaction was, we're going to go to jail if we preach the word, therefore, we are going to preach the word. The second is, we can't abandon our post. It's time for the church to stop backing down, backing down, relocating, giving up ground, giving up ideas, capitulating to the pressure of the social culture today. It's time that we mark it and say, you're not taking any more from me. Not, And here's where that appears. It's in Acts chapter 14 uh, and starting at verse 2. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brethren. This sounds like time to leave. But look at what the next verse said. Therefore, they stayed. Now, notice in the first, therefore, therefore, they preached. And this one says, therefore, they stayed. And a long time speaking boldly in the Lord, who was bearing witness to the word of his grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. Now, that's what's going to be your experience. Everyone that becomes defiant. Number one, don't abandon your message. Number two, don't give ground to the enemy. And number three is that God is going to give us divine strategies in this hour. You know, I was trying to ask God, now you've told me to go to San Francisco. You've told me to go to New York. You've told me to go to Miami and Boston and Seattle and all these cities that are absolutely adverse and locked up just the way Jericho was. So what happened to uh, Joshua when he couldn't get through the walls? The Bible says that the commander of the host of God's armies appeared to him and said, take off your shoes, you're on holy ground. And then Joshua said, what is speak your servant hears? What are my instructions? That's what I want you to do. First, I'm going to repeat, number one. We don't stop preaching. Number two, we don't give ground. Number three is in Proverbs 21, verse 22, which is amazing. A wise man scales the city of the mighty and brings down the trusted stronghold. How can we read that and believe that any city is unreachable? They're all reachable. There's, there's a capability for a miracle. But it says this, a wise man does it. The Bible says the secret of the Lord is with them that fear him. If you want to understand where the Bible tells us that strategies and ideas are available to us, it's in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5. Bringing down every thought and every lie and forcing it into the obedience of Christ. We have the words to debate the ungodly. We have the answers. Jesus said in Luke 21, I'll give you a mouth and wisdom that no, none of your adversaries will be able to gainsay or resist. 
Here it is again. A wise man scales the, the city of the mighty and brings down the trusted stronghold. We're going to do it, and we're going to believe God to do it. Todd, jump in yes. here right now, buddy. Yes. You know, I, as you were saying that, the Lord was speaking to my heart. The reason why a large portion of the church seems to have had the wind knocked out of her is because they put their hope in falsehoods. If you think about it, some of these words that you mentioned in the beginning of the broadcast, this didn't happen, that didn't happen, and, and people put their hope in these things. What we're presenting tonight is not one of those things. What we're presenting is the Bible. What we're presenting is what the Bible says will happen. What we've got to start doing is putting our hope and our trust back in Jesus, putting our hope in his Holy Spirit and the anointing of the Holy Spirit, not in Q or this prophet said this or whatever. And I know I'm going to get some heat for this, Mario, but I'm telling you that this was the plan of the enemy to say, oh, this didn't happen. That didn't happen. And to get everybody weary and beat down. Right. It's a shell game. It's right. a shell game. And meanwhile, we had the, the real weapons the whole time. We had the ability to actually take back the territory the whole time. But we've been looking over here and not looking at what the Lord wanted us to look at. That's the harvest of souls. So now we turn to the harvest. Listen, if you made that in, you know, many people have made that mistake. Just course correct. You know, just course correct. All of us need to course correct sometimes. But the bottom line is from this point forward, if we get our eyes on the prize, we make it about the main thing. We do what the Bible says to do. The Great Commission, make it about souls. I'm telling you, your business will be blessed. Your finances will be blessed. And you will be walking in the optimal call. And these cities are going to be set on fire for the kingdom of God. Mario, that's what the Lord is doing right now. You know, I'm going to play one last video because it was a moment that was very, very telling for me when God told me to warn preachers about something and i want to run that video right now of this warning that i gave in michigan just last night you know what the uh, verse that goes right with that is it's found in the old testament in the book of judges where it describes samson who got up like he did at all the other times and the power of god would come on him every single time power of God came on Samson when they attacked him. He could tear apart the most lethal bondage. He was capable of supernatural acts, killing a vast army with the jawbone of a donkey. And the Bible said he didn't understand that the Spirit of God had left him. The disaster wasn't simply that the Spirit of God had left but that he didn't know it. That is the greatest sin of the American church. The Holy Spirit left and we kept going. You're not helping me enough. The Holy Spirit left and we just kept going. We kept planning, we kept thinking, we kept building without the one who's in charge. And right now, I think there's a dividing line. We've got to get back to dependency on the Holy Spirit. But, you know, we've said that a lot. You know, what we haven't said enough is you need to repent and apologize to the Holy Spirit, folks, mm -hmm. for what you did. You can't just say, oh, I'm sorry, I did wrong, and now I'm going to be dependent on the Holy Spirit. No. you got to you got to fall before God in, in total repentance and say, I am so sorry. My nation is in trouble and I've used human power. But we want to leave this with a final note. And then I want you to have the last say and pray for the people. It is life and death that we trust the word of God. God is speaking. You know, the Bible, the, the Bible says, and he spoke to me, he said, lengthen. He said, enlarge the place of your tent, lengthen, lengthen, lengthen your cords, Make your stake strong. For me, that's literal. Not just figurative, that's literal. We are entering the season of the mass harvest in the darkest regions of the United States. And God is raising up people. This show, this program is being used of God to get those that need him. And for those who are watching that don't know him, we want you to know him. And we want you to know him now. And so final words, Todd, for our audience at a word of prayer. It's on you. Yeah. 
This is a moment of breakthrough tonight. We witnessed it. You witnessed it up in Michigan. I witnessed this last Friday. Something has changed. It's shifted. And God has given us marching orders. And so I want to pray for everybody right now. Very, very powerful show tonight. I know you feel it. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your presence here. Very tangible tonight. Lord God, we know that this is a moment of decision. This is a very important moment for the church, especially for the church here in America. So I just pray, Lord, these words Thank would you, resonate Lord. in our spirit. Even as we get off tonight, I pray this would continue to resonate, that you'd speak to our hearts, that you'd, you'd catch us on fire for you, that you'd give us strategy, that we'd step up, that we'd rise up, that we wouldn't be the apathetic church, the complacent church, the slumbering saints. Lord, I pray in this hour we would be actionable people of God that have a righteous heart, that have a righteous standard, that want to do what you have us to do. Let let us be in your perfect will. And Lord, we repent to you tonight for being off course. We repent if there's anything that has displeased you. I pray that you would sanctify us tonight, Lord God, that Lord, that we would from here on forward be about your business and we would make it about you. And Lord, we just thank you for what you're going to do. You're empowering folks right now. There is an anointing tonight. You are empowering folks right now to walk in accordance to your perfect will. And we just say yes. We say like Isaiah, send me in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. That's firepower. See you next Wednesday. It's going to keep getting stronger. God bless you. Thank you for tuning in to tonight's prophetic news. Show your support for Dutch, Mario, and Todd by leaving them a comment below. Thank you, and we will see you next time.